some scheduling issues. Uh, so luckily, he was able to um, become part of our um, uh, of our uh, schedule this this year. So uh, Kevin Comerford got his BFA from Texas A&M University Corpus Christi, um, and his MFA from Texas Christian University. Um, painter and a sculptor for over 38 years. Um, his recent works are inspired by the natural congruity between southwestern architecture and its surrounding landscape. Uh, he currently resides in Southern California. Uh, he was born in Arizona and has lived and worked all over the western United States. These other lying influences that fuel his desire to make art include great satisfaction that comes from wrestling with the interplay of geometry, color, and texture. He feels that when these elements are successfully brought together on canvas, they serve to inspire deep emotional responses in the viewer. Yeah. Making art is a sublime and complex interaction of thoughts and material expression that are indelibly connected to his personal view of the world. And so I can really see that, that Western United States thing in the <laughs> colors, and I'm really interested to hear what you have to say about the work, so if you would welcome uh, Sir Kevin Comerford. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, it's, it's great to see all of you here. Thank you for coming, and thank you for having me uh, show my work here. It's, it's, uh, it's nice. Uh, I mean, I, I try to show a little bit every year, but uh, I've got a day job as well, so I'm uh, having a solo show like this is a great opportunity. So you know, thank you to the art department, everyone at the art department. Um, I, uh, I actually, I went to school with Richard Smith, who's one of your instructors. Um, we went to both, uh, it was called Corpus Christi State University, it's a, now Texas A&M, and um, we also went to uh, Texas Christian uh, University together, and, then, um, and we, we, uh, we studied under Bruno Andrade at CCSU and at uh, Jim Woodson at uh, Texas Christian. Um, uh, and what are the, the limits that you can twist and pull a canvas uh, so that um, it becomes something that, that isn't a, a traditional sense of a, a, a painting that is a, a window that you look into, but something that comes out into the room and kind of bothers you a little bit. I don't mean bother in a negative sense, but it's... Um, I like it when my work can come out of the come out of the two-dimensional space of the wall and kind of do this at you uh, and and make you take notice of it. Um, I think the um, uh, the interaction of color is essential for uh, my work. Certainly, um, it is inspired by the environment I live in. Um, I've lived in New Mexico, Arizona, Southern California, South Texas. Um, and, but um, architecture plays a great deal in uh, sort of what I think about for uh, my work. Um, the, uh, the idea of uh, painting on a wall is something that ties us as artists together all the way back to our distant ancestors who, who painted on cave walls and then painted uh, on their, their early dwelling walls and in temples and places of worship. And, um, and so there's, a, there's definitely a, a sense of satisfaction I have with the, the idea of uh, a painting that has an architectural basis to it. Uh, the, the connection between making art that, um, that has all of the essential aesthetic elements is important. Um, I also, I'm really interested in, in making the art be more and live more in the world um, so that it isn't something that you feel is distant from your daily life but actually interacts with you. And I tried with various different devices to invite the interaction of the viewer uh, with my pieces. I hope you'll come look in the little, little insets in the windows and wonder what those are for. 
I even have some of these pieces that are designed for the viewer. If you don't like it this way, you can change it around. <laughs> and there's another piece out in the front where you can, you can, you can modify it a little bit. Um, so interaction with uh, the viewer is something that um, is, uh, really intrigues me. Um, you'll see a lot of artists in, when you take your art history uh, courses, uh, a lot of artists will include uh, devices and objects from sort of everyday life in their work. And I think they're, they're calling back to what makes you know, average everyday life better through art is kind of one of the reasons that those artists uh, include uh, include those. In fact, there's a there's a uh, a nice quote from Picasso that I, I always stuck in my mind that uh, the function of art is to shake the dust of everyday life off of our souls. And so I think we have art that that um, that sort of crosses the boundary between function, functional objects, and decorative objects. Um, it's something that, that can enhance everyday life. And so a lot of my work is also sort of, is inspired by what we would call folk art in, in very general terms. So um, especially folk art in the Southwest. You know, I've been all over the world and, um, if you go to the churches in New Mexico and you see the reredos, the, the screens, the altar screens that are hand, hand carved and hand painted, um, the little santos that you can get at uh, the, the cathedral sites across the state. Um, uh, New Mexico has a fantastic tra tradition in tin work that is amazing where uh, the artists create little um, little devices and objects that, that have doors and open and close and are, and are intriguing and enticing. And so that sort of congruence between what's functional and what is, what is an art object and, and sort of blurring the distinction between those two things is, is an, uh, an important part of my work as well. Um, let me see, I, I wrote a couple of notes because I've been driving for a long time and I'm, I want to make sure I don't miss anything important here. Um, yeah, with um, the, the idea of abstraction um, is, was an interesting issue in the sort of the history of art where, as I mentioned, I mean, the painting traditionally, originally was seen as an illusory device where you were trying to you're trying to look into the painting. Um, and I'm, I, what I like about the, the sort of color field way that uh, um, I've gotten accustomed to painting is that um, the, um, and in, including the little devices that I've put into the, the pieces, is that the, um, the object it's, itself becomes the image. So it doesn't depict uh, a representation of an image, but the when I have a window in a piece, it's an, a real window, uh, a real ladder or a shelf or um, little architectural details. So that level of abstraction is kind of intrigues me, and and it's one of those things. You know, when you as an artist, you look for the things that give you the strongest emotional reactions in your work, and that's what sort of fuels you to keep making more work. And everybody's interested in a multitude of different, different things, uh, different intellectual pursuits, different emotional responses. And so you're, when you work on a piece of art, you know, it's an, and all of those things come together as sort of an amalgam, any sort of a combination of different influences. And they will come out whether you consciously want them to or not. Um, and sometimes it's better to just let them let things come out naturally uh, that uh, you're interested in. But the um, and 
that kind of goes to the idea of the expressionistic quality of the paint application. Um, I like to use a very loose kind of brush stroke with a very thick paint. Um, and um, I like to make a lot of changes on my work uh, and, and uh, take a good amount of time. And I always, I always try to sort of design a piece so that it can have multiple layers of color uh, and, and provide sort of some, some color interactive depth that way. Um, the, um, you know, the expressionistic uh, brushwork is something that is um, uniquely my own. Um, so it, it speaks to my own individuality, although the, the application I try to make more generalized so that um, the piece be, stays an abstract work of art and doesn't become a representational piece. Um, what else? Can you talk about the tools that you use in painting? Is there specifically the one that I think is so obvious that's not a paintbrush? Um, it begins with a T and ends with a T. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I do, uh, that's, my wife is helping me along. Um, and, um, we met in art school as well, and, and she's a fantastic printmaker. Um, so yeah, uh, with the application, um, I will do color tests um, and try to do like a color plan for the work, but I like to do to include a lot of um, uh, sort of serendipitous interplay of color, so I, I try not to, to make the, the color planning too mechanistic. Um, I use a lot of tape, uh, that's what she was referring to, so to mask off areas of the, uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> the T and the E word. Uh, yeah, I use a lot of tape and different masking. I started using some, some uh, something equivalent to what we used to call frisket, but it's a masking liquid um, that is sort of more for um, house painting uh, that is more uh, applicable to larger size work. Um, what else? Yeah, I think the, um, um, I just lost my thought there, but, um, it's interesting working in three-dimensional pieces uh, because you tend to you tend to think in one dimension at a time. I think I've even noticed this with uh, sculptors that I've worked with that, that uh, you get really good idea of how it's going to look like from the front, and then you start looking from the side, and it's like oh that that needs some alteration. So it's uh, making the works has got to be a dynamic process of, of sort of making sure that you're looking from all angles that the viewer is going to look at. And, and then um, this, like this piece here, I love the way um, uh, everybody did the, who hung the show did the lighting, but um, the pieces that have three-dimensional elements react well with the, the lights. And the, the shadows become part of the work, and so that becomes, Something that, that you have to sort of plan into the work is, is uh, what it's going to look like when it's sitting on the wall and uh, being, uh, being lit from different angles. Let's see, what else have I got here? You know, I think there's, um, when we talk about um, the interplay of art and life, um, there is a sense that even if it's, if it's just only symbolic, that that you know, making art, any creative activity, um, there's so much. There is so much destruction and divisiveness in the world that any activity where we we are are exercising our abilities uh, creatively does make the world a better place, even though that sounds kind of soppy and, and uh, maybe a little silly. Um, 
but um, we have a lot of artists that um, uh, in throughout history that uh, have had that sort of utopian ideal in mind, and so that they studying these artists, um, spe specifically some uh, architects uh, that have sort of a utopian vision. I find very inspiring and sort of keep me interested in pursuing the architectural angle to my work. Uh, but if you will go look up uh, Paolo Soleri, uh, who has, he's dead now, but he, he had a, a, a construction site for a little uh, idealized city in Arizona called, called Arco Santi. Uh, Lucio Costa, he uh, was one of the original designers of the uh, Brazilian capital city, Brasilia. Um, and um, uh, Le, Cou Le Corbusier, I didn't pronounce his name correctly. Um, and he, um, his, uh, his work uh, was uh, globally um, uh, praised. And uh, he, he designed, in particular, I, I think a lot about uh, uh, Kandahar, the city of Kandahar in India. He designed the entire city, um, uh, which was a government capital for, for India. Uh, so those are some of some of the like broader influences. Um, I think for um, some specific influences that you might want to look up. And by the way, when I was an art student, uh, the library was fan a fantastic resource. And so much so that I'm a librarian today for my day job, and, and uh, um, I, I work on, uh, I paint on the weekends. Um, but there's a, a great number of artists that you can, you can look at for inspiration um, that are contemporary to us that have uh, really great ideas, really interesting ideas. Certainly Jasper Johns, somebody who's created uh, three-dimensional kinds of works. Um, his, uh, his motivations and mine are completely different types. Uh, Robert Rauschenberg, um, uh, my wife and I met him in Corpus Christi uh, when we were students. He had a, a show and I wrote him a letter and he came out and actually visited it with us uh, at the, uh, the school um, while I was there. Um, um, uh, Richard Devencorn, of course, if, if was the master of, um, you know, up through the 1980s of, of painterly abstraction. Um, Louise Nevelson has always been a hero of mine. Um, her work is, is fantastic. And if you go to the National Gallery in Washington, D.C., then like, one of her works that actually is like 20, 20 feet wide and sticks out over you as you go into the gallery to see it. Um, uh, she used a lot of assemblage. Um, and then if you want to learn about both teaching and being a painter, uh, Helen Frankenthaler um, is a, gave us, a, a she was married to Robert Motherwell, who's another important artist. But Helen Frankenthaler, you can find her um, interviews on the web. Um, she has her own, had her own foundation in that, but she gave fantastic um, uh, talks and lectures on how to be a painter and then also how to teach painting. And um, she was a, a pioneer that I'm, I'm particularly fond of as well. So those are some of my, my influences. Um, I'd be happy to uh, take any of your questions now. I kind of rambled on a little about a couple of different things, but if you have any thoughts or questions, what do you think about the work? I really want to touch them, and I want to know which ones I can touch. You can touch all of them. Yay! <laughs> yeah, I get so many, like, I guess kind of architectural or, or associations. Like, I'm sure everybody has their own reaction, but like that one to me, it makes me think that you're like talking about the pool. Mm -hmm. ah, yeah, I don't know. This is like, cool. like a deck, you know, mm -hmm. and a little ladder and the, the tile and everything. So, yeah. But I really want to go open the doors on this one right here. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm really glad to hear that, that you invite people to touch the work because that's something that, you, you know, art is always, when it's in a formal space, it's all about hands off and, you 
you know, we, I think we've all been yelled at by the gallery guards for Absolutely. not saying 12 inches away or whatever. And, and it's refreshing that, you know, you, that you encourage full interaction, you know, with, Absolutely. with the work. So I appreciate that quite a bit. You bet. Did you have a? Oh, I was going to ask, uh, what's your favorite um, art, like, from what you have in this area? Oh, your favorite piece. Your favorite piece, my friend. Which is my favorite piece? Hmm. Well, this guy is uh, one that I've suffered over quite a bit, so I think that's probably, and um, it, it was kind of late in the day when I, it finally comes together. You know, there's a point when you're painting that um, you, you start out sort of thinking, this is sort of how I'm going to be approaching you know, the work, and I've got sort of a color idea, and I've got a compositional idea, and then you get it on there, and it's like nothing like you really thought it was going to look at, look like. And then, so you keep working on it, and uh, layering color, and, re, you know, and adjusting the composition, and so forth. So this one gave me a, a lot of challenges. It was originally supposed to be um, much more intricate than it is. Um, and if you, we took it off the wall to see that there's some additional pieces of frame behind here because I had originally planned there to be a shelf and some other uh, devices that come out. So that those, the infrastructure is for it is there. But uh, once I got to this point with it, it, it told me not to go any further. So, so this guy is, is definitely my favorite out of that. Yes, sir? What's this fascination with symmetry? <laughs> <laughs> <Some of that. laughs> yeah, um, I think the, uh, the 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 balance um, of the work that is sort of inspired from the 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 geometric symmetry. Um, gives me an overall sort of framework to work in, and then I can go nuts on a limited basis inside the work, and I still have, I still can come out of it and have some compositional order, so. And I think, um, yeah, I think, I think I probably, I'll, I'll stop there before I talk myself into a corner. <laughs> Excellent. Well. Well, I asked Chris. a little bit this morning about, because I taught the library science or the information science and that yeah. organization, and I like the way you just phrased the structure and then the go nuts or the freedom. So on, say, construction that get juicier like Robert Rauschenberg, what are your thoughts or your connections <laughs> with, um, you know, Demon Core, Rauschenberg, Frankenthaler, what about something like Elizabeth Murray with her? shape canvases and juicy paint application versus Frank Stella, who kind of had that spectrum from yeah. the super clean to the super wild, where do they kind of sit in your influences or consideration? Well, um, as or my, my, yeah, my, my spouse can attest, I was, I was a lot, I was a lot more, more uh, wild uh, in application when I was a younger artist. Um, yeah, I think um, where I would go out of the options that you just gave me is to Sean Scully, okay. uh, who has this like, fantastic sort of rich, dripping, icing-like uh, application of paint, but he's still got his, his uh, geometrical um, structure there. Um, I'm not, I'm, I'm, you know, it's one of those things that uh, comes out as part of your personality that uh, I'm, I'm not an organicist, in, I guess. And so I, I really, I crave the, uh, the geometric uh, uh, complexity in the, in the, that, I, that uh, is well, in the world. And the brush and, and the color. Uh, so on your thoughts on color, like as you say, from a younger person to a wiser Person or Hopefully, why? <laughs> you know, none of my students from a design one class are here, but you know, we're investigating color. We're not necessarily controlling it, but uh, being aware of what it can do other than everybody, not everybody, 
more than I'd like. I want the flat fit, like the white, and, and, and ceramic too. It's like I want it blue. It's like, well, let's put color on color and see what happens. Uh, what were your thoughts on finding this kind of surface magic? Which I think Richard Smith, they look a lot like the way Richard Smith <laughs> builds that surface up too. So. Yeah, well, I think um, uh, Bruno Andrade had a very thick application of paint. He was our, our original uh, painting instructor. So, um, yeah, I think the, um, you know, there's different ways to approach layering paint um, and getting cup paint to, to display its color richness. Um, and Gla glazing is one avenue you can go to where you thin the paint and you create washes of paint over. Um, now if you're, if you're working on paper, certainly, you get also the added dimension of the, the bleed of the paint into the paper. Um, <clears throat> for, um, for working on canvas, um, you've got to create sort of a color base and then glaze over it with a very thin paint, but you have to have a substantial sort of um, color in the background really for it to work to give you a, a dynamism. Uh, and Deben, Richard, Richard Diebenkorn's work is he's, he's very thin, wispy layers of, of glaze where he thinned his paint. Um, he, he was an oil painter, so he thinned it with uh, different kinds of thinner and then and put very wispy sort of gauzy glazes. Um, I prefer to try to create um, more contrast with uh, and dry brushing work, you know, uh, so that the paint is thicker um, and that uh, it gives you more opportunities for, you know, with uh, more contrasting kinds of color design in the painting. It gives you more opportunity to see that both the substantialness of a thicker paint, but also the, the interplay of layers of that paint. So there's, so there's different ways to approach getting color to work with you in paint. Um, I, something I would say since you, we have, you're all studying um, you know, uh, art right now in the, the studio that the, um, there is no sort of substitute from, for, for knowing your materials and how the materials behave um, before you start thinking about the actual color design of your work because depending on what kind of paint, if you're using oil paint or if you're using ink in printmaking or if you're using uh, acrylic paint, which I do because I, I like the way it dries quickly and then I can make changes quickly with it. Um, but they all behave differently and they all behave differently depending on even brand of the type of material that you buy. So if you mix um, orange and green from two different paint brands, you're going to get a different result than if you, um, you know, are using just a single paint brand. And if you go to the dollar store, like I have done when I was desperate, and you know, you get get the orange, um, you know, there for uh, that's uh, really inexpensive. Um, it's going to turn colors on you quickly. It's going to become gray, brown, and it will look terrible. Um, when somebody, you know, somebody sells you a tube of paint that says cadmium red, uh, you have to know whether it's really cadmium red or if it's somebody who's just synthesized something that's tonally like cadmium red. Um, so that uh, you, you have um, an understanding of when you mix that with another color what you're going to get. So testing out your your color ideas, I think, is really important when you start a painting, um, or yeah, any kind of work that you're using of you know a fluid um, kind of color medium with, um, and then different kind, you know, different brands of paints are great when you're a student. Um, they tend to be 
they tend to not be as good for you when, when you move on and, and start making more serious work that you want to, to last. Um, so mastery of your materials is something that, that you should really work on while you're here and you, you have time you know, to experiment with, with how they work. So, so I, that was a long way around that original question, sorry. Thank you for saying that because that's exactly what I'm trying to teach them. <laughs> Yeah, um, you know, I found, I found this German acrylic paint called Lucas that um, has got this fantastic pigmentation that really gives you bright colors. And um, it's a little more expensive, but, um, uh, you know, but there's several brands of acrylic paint that are really good. Um, but we're living in a really nice time right now. When, when I went to school, there weren't that many options for materials um, and today you know you, you can go to Michael's you can go to Hobby Lobby you can go to online um, to Blick or whoever else um, Daniel Smith uh, kind of things um, but um, you've got lots of different options and there's lots of different um, cost sort of levels you know pricing levels so that you can you can always get something good and you've got lots of things to choose from so were there other questions? Okay. The thoughts? Yeah. Um, is there a theme going on with your pieces? Like, I noticed that that one over there, you named it like cover or shield. That one over there was, I think, storage. And this <laughs> one was parapet, I think. Was there like a theme going on? Yeah, so um, that's, that's a great question. And you, you, I was wondering if anybody was going to ask about the titles. Um, as we were talking about the sort of the idea of uh, art having a, a larger sort of utopian contribution to make to humanity. Um, so I've been, uh, some of my titles are in Spanish and they are because I've, I have, like, Trastero. Um, uh, that's to, because I was inspired by uh, something in the Southwest, that um, um, piece of folk art or a, a location or something like that that uh, kind of inspired that work. Uh, some of the other titles are in Esperanto, which was, is now it's kind of an, uh, a it's a sort of defunct uh, project to make in a universal language. And it's, it's based on the Romance languages. Um, so I've, and I've usually taken, it's a, some sort of architectural type, like parapeto um, is the, uh, the um, Esperanto word for parapet. Uh, so, I, yeah, I tried to name these uh, these uh, as different kinds of either de mechanical devices or architectural features. And um, using the Esperanto is just a way to, to hopefully give it an ad a little additional dimension um, for the, the underlying theme. Um, I try not to be too narrative with my work, but that's one area that I couldn't resist um, trying to, to add a little bit of extra interest in the pieces. Other thoughts or questions? So just, a, just a thought. I thought it was, it was great that you were you know, discussing about uh, the, the planning phases in your work, uh, about um, you know, the inspiration, not really knowing where that inspiration is going to come from. I was going to manifest in your work. Uh, but I think it's, it's relevant to at least my experience with students. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, you know, students want to dive right into it. And mm -hmm. they want to, uh, they'll take the canvas and straight into the finished work. Uh, but I think it's great that you were, you know, talking about your process, the, the pre-planning phase, how important that phase was, yeah. and also allowing the paint, once it's getting on the canvas, that plan may not execute as no, I think that's that's a great point. You know, there's the saying that um, I'm trying to trying to paraphrase it, but um, um, 
like no combat plan survives enemy fire is the, the idea that uh, you, can, you can plan something as, as closely as you want. There is a, you know, a, a point where your plans kind of fall apart once you get into the middle of something. But um, the plan is always there to guide you so that you, you have a, you want, what you want is you really want a coherent visual statement out of your work. You want, it to, you want a, a message that's clear and that um, communicates what you want to say or what you want the viewer to feel, or at least gets, gives it a good try. I mean, you can't make people, you know, understand your work exactly the way you want. But, um, and having a, a good plan for your work and, and a, a, a um, uh, concrete notion of what you're, what you're trying to achieve helps you along the way. And then, then when the surprises come up, as you mentioned, you have the, you know, you have sort of a framework around your ideas that helps you um, sort of navigate the surprises to make them work for you instead of against you. I can tell you there's a bunch of, there's, on every piece there's a point where I made a wrong move and it's like, oh, that just cost me, you know, that's gonna cost me, you know, a long time to get back to where I want because I just, uh, something dripped the way I didn't think it was going to drip or whatever, so. So that interplay I think is really important. And I, also, I should mention, I, I didn't, we didn't get into sort of, you know, I really prefer working um, with the, the physical materials of uh, traditional art media, and I'm never, I'm never going to give that up. Um, but my work, um, sort of my career, has taken me into digital media a lot. Um, and uh, in cultural heritage, so history and museums and so forth. So, um, and, and today I, I run a, a couple of libraries at New Mexico State University and we have a maker space and uh, we have student labs and stuff. So um, there's a lot of really interesting things you can do to help sort of develop your work digitally and have it come out um, in a physical format. So. This is a little maquette that I did for a larger work that I did on a 3D printer. So I did the design for the piece. It's gonna, it's gonna be, the pieces are gonna move. Um, but, um, so this is gonna be like a larger work that's a, a painting. But uh, to kind of get the proportions and the little moving pieces down, I designed this in, uh, application called Maya, which is a 3D design software, and then converted it so I could print it on a 3D printer and then printed it into pieces and then assembled it like a little sculpture. Um, so all of these have a 3D model that I did to help me work out the framework underneath. Um, and then the 3D model um, I'll have those, actually have those up online on my website, so I have little cards up at the front you can check on later on. I'll put the models up and I have a, I have a 3D gallery, I redid this gallery in sort of a 3D model that I'll put them all in and stuff, so. Uh, I have a question about the structure of your work, like for example when I do stuff, I design everything are you involved in all the process, or do you outsource parts? Of the no, I, I everything I do my everything myself. Uh, so, yeah. yeah. Um, and um, we've got we've got nice photos of me struggling to get the frames braced and all of that. So, um, yeah. So, um, and Joanne helped me quite a bit with stretching the canvas, which. I was talking to one of the students. It's kind of interesting when you, when you poke holes in your canvas, um, then and how to how to do that successfully is is there are some tricks and um, um, typically what you want to do is you build a frame like this that has little crossbars that create the windows for you and then stretch the canvas over the whole thing and then. 
slash, and this is where you have to have some faith, and that you, you've got the, uh, you're doing it correctly, but you slash the uh, corners, and, and then you have to restretch the canvas, and then tie it, you know, you have to, in this case, I found I had to glue the flaps down, because they, they otherwise they kept tugging out, and then you wash the whole back of the canvas in water uh, when you're done and it tightens everything back up like a drum uh, so that you, because you don't, otherwise you can get like sagging in areas like this in between the shapes and so forth. So, and I noticed that, um, uh, so I think Chris, you mentioned Frank Stella. Um, one of the things I, I went back to uh, when I started poking holes in the canvas was looking at his early um, copper paintings. Um, and he actually, he poked some holes in uh, some shaped canvases and, and he made it look like that, that he was able to stretch the canvas through the hole. But, uh, and I was, I was thinking, like, how did he do that? I'd really like to do that. And then I, I got, I sort of blew up one of his, the pictures of his phone, and he actually, he put a plate in there just like this to cover it over and hold it down. So even Frank couldn't get around that uh, <laughs> particular problem. Um, I've heard some people comment uh, about how some of the pieces are deceptively lightweight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, the, the larger pieces are made with, with pine or poplar, and uh, they are heavier, definitely. Um, I've worked in, in uh, basswood and even balsa wood for some of the smaller pieces, and uh, that's so that they don't get too heavy for their size. So if you want something that's small, to be able to be lightweight, and, and uh, especially if you're gonna ship them to shows, you don't want something that weighs 30 pounds um, yeah, to, that um, you take. So, um, yeah, like the, these little pieces here, this guy here, um, yeah, that one, they're, they're not balsa wood, but they're very lightweight wood, so some of them are bass wood, and, and some of them are very light pine, very thin pine. So um, it's nice to be able to to be able to port. You know, they make them portable so that uh, they aren't too heavy. Um, but yeah, the the others are, are really heavy. So. Anything else? Well, I really appreciate your coming and and uh, looking at the work and. Feel free to let me know what you think uh, offline, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you.